My name is Mike, as you well know. So I want to continue on this theme because I didn't get, I had I got a lot of preliminaries to cover in that first part. So I want to concentrate more on what I was talking about. But let's go over again. See, the reason, the reason that, that those of us that have went through real repentance and been cleansed by the blood and the reconciliation, the, the ransom, the reason that we, you know, we fear God and we hate sin and those that love God hate sin, like Proverbs 8, 8 13 and Psalm 97, 10 say, see, the reason for this, like it says in the Septuagint, it says here in, in uh, Proverbs 12, verse 23, it says, nothing unrighteous will ever be pleasing to the righteous, but the ungodly will be filled with evil things. See, again, you're filled with, with this substitution model. You're filled with the evil thoughts, impurities, filthy rags, divorces, fornications, drunkenness, all the things that destroy your lives. You get on the blogs all day long and you cry out for deliverance. But when somebody comes on there, like one of the brothers, and tells you what to do, to repent, to go to God, to plead for mercy, you, you call them a heretic. You say they're full of pride and they don't love anybody. Well, what's love? Is love to condone these things? See, the agape love of God does not cover sin by excusing the sinner from blame. That's what you think over here. Excuse everything. Just love them and they'll come to redemption. No. They'll come to receiving Jesus, maybe. They'll come to join in your club, but they won't come to redemption through repentance and faith proven by deeds. See, love covers a multitude of sins, it says in James 5.20 and 1 Peter 4.8. But that's implying the exact opposite of condoning sinful behavior. See, so, because why? Because love does not rejoice in iniquity, but in the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. So you love, you guys read that at your weddings. They read 1 Corinthians 13, 6 as though it applies to how you're going to love your spouse and then you go out and commit adultery on them anyway. Many, many of you do. But see, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but in the truth. So what is the love of God? The love of God is to stop sinning, be released from bondage, be purged within, and be pure at heart and keep His commandments. That's what... That's why. That's why we hate iniquity. That's why the heart of the righteous is made sad, who God has not made sad. And the hand of the wicked has been strengthened through this message that is preached far and wide at every church I've ever seen. And many of the brothers that have been redeemed that come to us in our, in our little study group have the same thing. They can't find anywhere where this message is not preached. Anywhere. So the, what? Real faith. Before we do that, I wrote D-I-D-A-C-H-E. It's a, it's a Greek word that means doctrine. Look that up on the internet. Type that in. I say dishad, or some people say dakahe. I don't know how it's pronounced. I'm not a linguist. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Type it in and look it up, and you'll find this is one of the most ancient documents. It's from the very first century saints that outlines the practice among the brethren and what is the way of truth and the way of the way of wickedness there was a way of a, a, there's a way of light a way of darkness a way of righteousness a way of death is a way that, just read it read it it actually it, it even comes right out and says that it pr protecting the unborn that if you you kill a child either in the womb or after it's been, after it's come out of the womb that God condemns. It even says that. Look it up, and you'll, you'll get a taste. Take that to one of your little Bible studies in your, in your little uh, fun and games churches and see what they think. Then you'll begin to understand what the ancient Christians taught. And they didn't teach us. They didn't teach this. They taught real faith could be imputed as righteousness because why? Because faith upholds the law. It establishes the law. It's the greatest commandment. Keeping the commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, on that hangs all the law in the prophets. That's why faith establishes the law. I have never heard one of these teachers that teaches this provision nonsense ever say, in quote, Romans 3.31, that faith, what, faith make void the law? No, faith establishes or upholds the law, it means. Why? Because it is 
a fulfillment of the commandment that Christ came to try to tell these people that were in apostasy. Again, like I said, he didn't debate with them. He exposed them. And that's what we're doing here. We're not debating these whether or not substitution is true or eternal security. No, no, those days are gone. When I come to realize that this whole system is preaching that you get saved in your sins, then I realize that it's not a debate here. It's, a, it's to expose this deadly, horrible doctrine that's got millions of people on the road to perdition. That's what we need to do. So you've got to be a newness of life, pure, pure, pure mind and pure heart. The old man must be put to death. Crucify the flesh, knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Destroyed, that word means. It's not, a provi it's not done by, uh, gradually or by provision or sin repent, sin repent. No, that's not what John meant in 1 John. We'll look at that. But most people are hung up. I get a lot of posts that they're hung up on grace. This free gift aspect of grace that's been pounded into their brains. See, they think grace means uh, means unmerited favor. Of course, it doesn't mean that at all. It just mean it means favor, or uh, you know, given given somebody something. But they're stuck upon this concept of of grace. Grace is taken from a couple, from a Greek word charis, C H A. R I S, which is closely related to two other verbs in the Greek that are used throughout the Bible. One is uh, C H A A R I O, meaning to rejoice exceedingly. It's often used as a salutation or a hail. And another Greek verb, Greek, Greek verb that's used to describe that same that same idea is charisma. In First John two. Verses 20 and 27, it's, it's either translated as unction or anointing. Well, the reason it's translated anointing is because that's what the word meant. It didn't mean that I had this great charisma, that I could win people over and influence them by, and coerce them by my words. And, and that, no, that's not what the Holy Spirit does. See, the Holy Spirit's an anointing. The word means an anointing or a spreading of oil or a salve upon the skin. That's where the word came from. It got translated into our word for charisma, which means exactly what I just said, but that's not what the word means in the Greek. So the anointing that we receive from the Holy Spirit teaches us God's truth. So that all has to do with the grace. So the, the lexicon, if you look up the old lexicon, Strom's lexicon, it defines grace like this, the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, keeps strengthens, increases them in the faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of Christian virtues. Now that fits right into what the Bible says. You know, Strom's goes back to the 1800s, of course. What's the Bible saying? Titus 2.11, the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us, he purified us, made us his own special people, loosely translated, uh, Titus 2, 11 through 14. So to bring us into newness of life, that's what grace is to do. So the question is, do you sin every day and everybody sins all the time? And 1 John 1, 8 says, if I deny that I sin all the time or I have sin dwelling in me, then I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. That's how you translate 1 John 1, 8. Well, how can you claim that you have received grace wouldn't you say grace is an exceeding great and precious gift from God? Exceeding great and precious promises of God, like Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. So how can you receive that and then remain in this wretched state of sinfulness where you're carnal, sold under sin, like Romans 7, 14 says? How can you be? How can you be desperately wicked and nothing you do is just but filthy rags to God? You can't do what's right. And everything else you can, because if you don't, you probably get arrested in life if you don't do what's right. But when God, when we come to God here, we can't keep our covenant with God. We can't love Him. We can't walk in moral perfection with Him. You know, some of us can with our wives. I know, of course, in, in, in our case, that have been redeemed by Christ. My wife and I were saved at the same time. We've walked in moral perfection to each other since then for the past 30-something years. Well, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying how, can that, how that contrasts on the other side where they say, well, you can be perfect at your job, you can be perfect at making money in your chosen profession, the greatest athlete in the world, 
the greatest basketball, football player, whatever, whatever, boxer, but you can't walk in moral perfection with God. All of a sudden with God, it's tossed out the window because we have this horrible sin nature dwelling in us. Well, sin nature came along the same deal here. The same deal. It was invented by men. Of course, it goes back to ancient times in Rome, in, the, in Rome, 3rd and 4th century. And again, you can easily verify that. But that came out of pagan teachings, out of something called Manichaeism, the dual nature of man. It was never taught by the Christians. Never taught by the Jews. It was never taught by the Christians. To this day, if you talk to a Jewish rabbi about a sin nature, he'll shake his head. They don't teach it. They never have. So if Judeo-Christianity is what Christ descended from, then why did this, this magic thing pop up? See, the reason you think Romans 5.12 teaches it is because, you, the, again, that misunderstanding of the Word, trying to twist and torture the Word, stretch it to fit into your doctrines. That's, that's the only reason. So grace, grace then brings this newness of life, this pure mind, this healing of the mind. See, what, when Jesus says in Matthew 13 there, he says that they, they, they would listen with their hearts and, and their, their minds and that I should heal them. That I should, how, what do you mean? Heal, heal them of this insanity of living in sin and justifying it by some kind of doctrine. No, no, grace. Grace brings about. It puts the old man to death in reality, not by provision, in reality and crucifies the passions and desires of the flesh. That's the, pa that's the sin. It's not that your flesh is inherently sinful or that your nature was somehow corrupted by Adam. That's nonsense. That's absurd. The Bible doesn't teach that. And I cover that in all my writings and my book and stuff about all the verses that they think proves that. No, it, it, they never taught anything like that, that man had perfectly free agency and will to obey God. And in fact, Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him take up his cross. It says seven times in the Gospels. Will means a determined, purposeful choice that you make. That's what the word, look up the word will, if anyone will come after me. So it, it requires a desire to find the truth. That's why on this side, it just requires trusting in some magic thing you don't understand. Some of you understand it better than others, but most people they just trust in whatever the pastor says. No, no, on this side it says, come, let us reason together. He's found by those that diligently seek him. Ask, seek, and knock, and you shall find. Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. That's the people that are going to find God. So the boasting that Paul's talking about, the boasting is talking about the, the Jews boasting in the law, boasting that they're keeping the law in Romans chapter 2 there. You know, they boast in the law, but yet they don't keep the law. They tell others to do this, but yet they don't do it. So their boast, that's what he was talking about in Ephesians chapter 2. He wasn't talking about that it's boasting to be cleansed and purged and purified by the blood of Christ and then walk in newness of life according to the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. No, that's not boasting. That's what happens in reconciliation. After you approach that mercy seat, you're sprinkled with that blood, broken in repentance. And I know, I know it's a foreign concept. I mean, ransom is a total foreign concept to the people in the system. I understand that. It's even a foreign concept to some people out of the system. But it's repentance and faith proven by deeds, like Acts 26.18 says. So it's not boasting to say that you are walking in that newness of life, that I've been purged and cleansed, that my mind's been purified. I'm no longer plagued with these filthy thoughts all the time. With the fil my, mind's, my mind and my conscience is purified. What's he say in Hebrews? What's he say in Hebrews uh, 9.14? He, he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself, see, he was a sin offering, Without spot to God, purge your conscience. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, that we may serve Him acceptably with reverence and godly fear, as Hebrews 12 talks about. That's, that's, not, that's not boasting like you people think. See, the boast that's defined, it's defined in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 and 23, where Paul was accusing them of striving for the letter of the law but violating the spirit of it by transgression. 
So gr grace, then, is a free gift. Yeah. But God will not allow this to become a license for sin, like Romans 1, chapter, Romans 8, 6, 1 and 15. Well, then we sin, so grace abound. Oh, God forbid. You know, if, you, if you're a slave to sin, you sin, you're a slave to sin. No, it's not going to become a license to sin. You can, in, you can believe, as many of you have done, you can believe in vain. It's like 2 Corinthians says, that we receive not the grace of God in vain. Look that word up. It means without purpose to no value. That's what it means. That's, and that's what's happened with these people. What's First uh, Corinthians fifteen two? What's he say that the, by this grace in which we stand, you know that that you've received unless you unless you believed in vain, if you hold fast to it, unless you believed in vain, what to no purpose, without 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 effect. So this nonsense idea that you're pre forgiven, that God's not going to hold you accountable for your sins because of some magic cover that took place in this provision is not in the scriptures. It doesn't have anything to do with the scriptures. That's why the scripture says if you sin willfully after you have received a knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice remains for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of fire, indignation, and judgment in Hebrews 10. That's why it says that. I know you're probably very confused about what that means, but it means exactly what it says under this model of redemption of ransom, that you can't re-crucify Christ you, he won't allow his blood to be trampled and turned into a license to sin. And Christ become a minister of sin, like Paul said in Galatians chapter 2. Well, you're going to make Christ a minister of sin? Well, no, you make Christ a minister of sin by saying that you can't stop sinning. Or if you stop sinning, you're saving yourself and you don't need Jesus. Well, again, can you find that kind of stuff in the Bible anywhere? Go and sin no more is what you find in the Bible. Depart from iniquity. That's what you see in the Scriptures. So if, if pre-forgiveness is true, then why these warnings about willfully sinning against your knowledge of the truth? And I know your pastors say that's not full knowledge, and, but look it up. It means full and complete knowledge. See, in the wrath of God, then, under this provision, they say the wrath of God has been fully satisfied. That's what Ray Comfort and them guys teach. It's been fully satisfied in his sacrifice on the cross. It's finished. It's finished. They, they, it's what they love to tell the people. So why is then, does the Bible say there's wrath yet to come on the children of disobedience in Ephesians 5, 6, in Colossians 3, 5? See, Christ died, yes, 2,000 odd years ago, reconciling the world unto himself, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. But that does not mean that mankind is automatically reconcil reconciled or restored to favor with God. He has yet to be reconciled, like I read in that uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, be reconciled. We plead with you through Christ, be reconciled. Why else would there be a purpose for the ministry of preaching repentance? See, there's, there's hardly a need for it under substitution, provision. See, just believing in Christ is born doesn't mean that you have a free ticket to paradise like the Christmas people think, that they flock into the church at Christmas. Because I believe this little baby in the manger then that means I'm, I'm redeemed. So we go home and we pray before we eat and we sit down in our debauchery and, and, and uh, go about our ways. And then the question of chastising and scourging comes into play here in Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. I know they talk about a relationship here and not anything that affects the outcome of your salvation. I know that's a spin that they put on it. But that's not the spin the Scriptures puts on it. See, the... Chastening, of course, is a strong rebuke and instruction to castigate a person for their wrongdoing. But scourging, the word used there in the, in the old King James Version, scourging, look it up, it's what Christ went through before his crucifixion. Matthew 23, 34, uh, John 19, 1. So why would God then punish you for your rebellious behavior if your sins are already forgiven, there, it's already been full payment made for your sin? Like Ray Comfort teaches, that full payment, jail door swings open, the drunk guy go, the drunk driver goes out, and it's, it's all in the past. No, no, uh, pr no clearing of wrongdoing, no reconciliation, no repentance proven by deeds, nothing. You're just automatically forgiven. So why would that be? Why would Christ then yet, God yet punish people to just maintain a relationship? 
but not affect the outcome of your salvation. That's what you're taught. That's what you're taught. But still, it seems silly to worry about a relationship that's signed, sealed, and delivered in advance, and nobody believes that it's the least bit concerned. Nobody that believes in these absurdities on, over here is the least bit concerned about their conduct in the first place. Because they love to call themselves the Romans wretch and the filthy sinner, the chief, they call Paul the chief of sinners and all the rest of it. They love it, so they're not the least bit concerned. So the real question is, why chastisement? What is chastisement? See, it only exists in the minds of the theologians because it's in Hebrews chapter 12. they got to say something about it. So they make it a relational thing. And some of them even go as far as saying the ridiculous notion that God's going to kill somebody for their sin, for their rebellion, going out and getting drunk and all that too many times, and then take them to heaven early. Outrageous, but many teach it. I think Charles Stanley teaches that. It's, it's ludicrous, and it's going to put people in perdition. See, if people can repeat some words and magically be, be declared righteous while their heart remains desperately wicked and have their sins pre-forgiven and be eternally secure no matter what they do, then why should you believe in anything? You know, why believe in anything? Since the power of God is so pathetic, so pathetic that it cannot authentically transform your heart and mind and heal you from this addiction you have to drunkenness and fornication and lust and pornography viewing on the internet and all these things that we hear, see on the blogs constantly, then, then why bother? Then why bother? See, if, if, if that's the case, then why not eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, pie in the sky when we die, by and by. See, the best God has to offer on this provision is a lifetime of addiction to lust, alcohol, drugs, perversion, worldly distractions. That's the best he has to offer. You just try to sin a little bit less, join the club, go to the meetings, join the little help groups, get the little philosophy books that they write, feel good about what you're doing, but you're saved like the Promise Keepers does. They don't have anybody delivered or redeemed from their sin. I've, I've, heard, I've heard testimonies from people that finally, finally found true repentance that for 15 years they went through addiction, back into the addiction again and again and again, even after they got hyped up at the Promise Keepers rallies and went up there and cried and hollered and screamed and, and sang the songs how Christ was going to deliver it. See, they believe that God's going to do it for them. But he says to cleanse yourself of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your soul. See, that's what they never hear. Purge yourself. Cleanse yourself. Amend your ways. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That's what the Bible says. See, but you can't do that when you're taught that the minute you come into the church, you're this filthy, rotten sinner, and we're just sinners saved by grace, and we're just one beggar handing another beggar the way to redemption and the free ticket to glory. And that's what you're taught, that you're born that way, and you could never reach this, this moral perfection in Christ. But you can through this form of reconciliation and repentance. And it's not bragging, it's not boasting, it's what God wants. It fulfills the scriptures. So really, why, why even worry about anything, about chastising or relationships? So what do you get saved from? You know, like you say, by your own admission, you're the chief of sinner, you're the Roman's wretch, you have a desperately wicked heart, filthy rags. You, you take all those scriptures and, and you don't read the rest of what it says in, in uh, those scriptures, like Isaiah 64, 6 and Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. See, they're comparing the righteous with the wicked. They're not saying that every man born has got a filthy, desperately wicked heart, or that the righteousness of all mankind is filthy rag. No, the, Isaiah was preaching to a fallen and sinful and dwelling in iniquity generation that was offering up sacrifices to God, but they were filthy rags in his sight. I'm not saying that believers are offering up filthy rags to God. No, it's acceptable sacrifices. It's worthy. It's a sweet-smelling aroma unto God. Sin is a rotten stench. The, righteous, the righteousness of God is a sweet-smelling aroma that, that is placed within your heart by doing the right thing. So what do you get saved from? You know, you mimic the, re the rhetoric of all this, uh, this reform doctrine. You, you repeat after your preachers. You repeat after all these Bible pundits. 
tell you it's not necessary to stop sinning and every excuse under the sun to, that you don't have to do the right thing. You're still saved no matter what you do. So faith is a work. Faith is synonymous with works. Like, it says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Like Philippians 2.11. Righteousness is what you do. It's not magically imputed to you, transferred from Christ. Nothing in the Bible teaches that. And no one ever taught that for the first 300 years of Christianity. The first thousand years, actually. Except for maybe the Roman church getting all messed up there in the 4th century. Righteousness is what you do. He who does what is right is righteous, the Scriptures teach. I've had people tell me that's self-righteousness. I mean, how absurd. Can't you even stop for a minute, stop sinning for a minute, and think how absurd saying that is. When John said, he who sins is of the devil, but he who does what is right is righteous. 1 John 3, 7. How absurd. And willful sin is going to separate you from God. It's going to separate you. So this absurdity that, that you're saved apart from anything that you do is just that. It's, it's an absurdity that came out of the minds of men. Like I said, you can go back and you can pinpoint when this penal substitution. See, that's what they're teaching. They're not teaching just satisfaction like came in at the 11th century. The idea of a substitution that satisfied See, it was a satisfaction. It had nothing to do with appeasing the wrath of God. But penal substitution came out, you know where it came from? Out of the minds of lawyers that looked at this, this salvation as some kind of uh, judicial uh, transfer. It's just, just some kind of an edict from God. He, here's this God, this big, moral, uh, awesomely perfect God decreeing these things. So if you follow these guidelines, then you can be declared righteous in his court by proxy by trusting in this provision that he's made see that's where it came from and penal substitution is probably among the worst in transferred of righteousness nobody even dreamed of doing anything but obeying christ and walking in newness of life of imitating his example like peter says that we walk in his footsteps that was the purpose of the whole thing that we walk after him so what are you getting saved from? If all you're going to do is make excuses for sin and call everybody that says they've been redeemed and purified by the grace of God, by the blood of Christ, as they're self-righteous and they're saving themselves, can't you see how absurd that is? How foolish it is to keep posting that stuff when you never check this stuff out. Dig into these things. I beseech you with everything that's in me to check this out. This is the model that's taught in the Bible, but not in the system churches. Ran ransom, redemption, and reconciliation. Remember, what's it mean? Ran redemption means release from bondage by payment of ransom. Just like Peter said. What did Peter say? Second Peter chapter 1. He says that we may be saved from the corrupting corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow, through the exceeding great and precious promises of God. What is that? His grace. So if you receive the grace of God through this process, then you've been redeemed from the, you've been released from that bondage. And like I say, I know many people that have, and they're not walking in filthiness. They don't have filthy minds. They're not constantly having to go view pornography on the internet and then say, oh gee, I'm sorry are wrecking their lives with unwanted pregnancies and divorces and living together and, and all this other stuff that you people post on the blogs. You're defending the wrong thing here. You need to be defending righteous behavior. Righteous behavior. Those who love God hate iniquity. Those who fear the Lord hate sin. That's what the scripture says. So do you? Are you going to trample his blood and spit on the spirit of grace and pretend that Jesus obeyed in your place and think that these vile sins, if you stop a vile sin, if you stop fornicating and getting drunk and running around, that that's earning your salvation? It has nothing to do with earning your salvation. It has to do with getting you cleansed from your sin and released from bondage. So I just ask you to take an honest look at these things. We'll go over some more lessons that I have written up in this booklet I'm going to put out. And just decide in your minds what you're being taught. Is it truth 
Or is it error? Is the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth based on what the apostles taught, or the spirit of error based on what men teach? The doctrines and the commandments of men, like Jesus said. Do it. 